welcome to season two, episode two of ECGI's workshop series on the EU sustainable corporate governance proposals that now runs under the title Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence. Uh, my name is Marco Becht. I'm the executive director of ECGI and I'm here to welcome you and provide a re brief recap of uh, episode one that took place yesterday afternoon. And uh, this is jointly organized with the brand new um, Institute for Business Law at Stockholm, at the Stockholm School of Economics. So Rolf Skog yesterday provided an excellent recap of season one. He pointed out that season two is more focused and rightly so, because it makes sense to bring EU proposals on supply chains when France and Germany already have national laws uh, on that subject. He also highlighted a little known and generally overlooked institution in the Brussels policy making process, the scrutiny board. Uh, and what that board does is it provides expert review of legislative proposals before they go to the democratically elected institutions, the European Parliament and the, governance, uh, the governments of the EU member states. Now, in case you're wondering what such feedback from the scrutiny board looks like, and that was maybe something that we were wondering yesterday, the European Commission, while we were speaking yesterday, published the text. So if you go to the website and you will have the, in case you don't have it, uh, it's going to be put in the chat. Uh, it does read like a referee review from a peer review journal in finance or in law. And it does read a little bit like a revise and resubmit uh, twice. Um, and that's really what it was. So as academics, we're very well familiar with this. Uh, we know how much work it is to do the revise and resubmit. But we also know how important that is in terms of the process, uh, because it does provide that kind of expert scrutiny that, pro that provides normally for better uh, papers uh, and proposals. So I commend it to you uh, as staple reading. Now, along with the scrutiny board assessment, the Commission yesterday also published an impact assessment report, three staff working papers that are essentially responses to that referee report, and announced another feedback period um, of eight weeks commencing yesterday. Uh, this makes our workshop even more relevant and it is recorded, so what you say um, is on the record. Uh, now there's also further reading because there is a 245 page impact assessment report uh, and there will be more to discuss um, moving forward. Now uh, this being said, turning back to what Paul said yesterday, um, he set out the um, proposal for the directive in such a way that non-lawyers like myself can start to understand its full scope and start to grasp some of the obvious problems that need to be discussed. Now, most striking for me was the scope. Um, beware of the appendix and what is included by reference. So the directive itself is not very long. But if you look at the, uh, if, uh, look at the um, appendix, they actually listed uh, 12 violations of international um, environmental conventions, 21 on human rights, and you know, counting the number of conventions that are being mentioned is actually quite difficult. Now, as Guido Ferrarini pointed out, that proposal converts international soft law into EU hard law. And since I now know what dynamic alignment means, that kind of took on a completely new uh, meaning uh, in this case, dynamically aligning with something that's actually outside of the EU. Now, some of the implications for implementation were also highlighted and immediately worrisome. Uh, now, ensuring compliance with such, a lost link, with, with such a long list of major tasks is for boards, compliance departments uh, is uh, tasking. They'll probably have to spend a lot of money on external help and advisors. Um, now, since transposition and enforcement will be at the level of the member states, you could just see how there will be temptation or might be temptation to offer more lenient transpositions and or enforcement to attract incorporations, listing and all the rest of it, if in doubt, think tax rules and golden visas. Now, finally, there's an obvious link with ESG disclosures and ratings. 
Now, the paradox there is that they actually, as far as I could tell, and as far as people told me yesterday, there is at the moment no link, which means that ESG ratings, the minimum standard study that's ongoing, the discussion about non-financial disclosure standards, etc., take back place in parallel, which means that at the moment we are really uh, talking about a parallel exercise trying to achieve very much the same goals. So just from yesterday, lots of things to discuss, but there's more to discuss even before having read the 249 page impact assessment. And for that, I turn over for episode two of this season two uh, to my uh, very dear colleague and friend, Luca Enriquez. Luca. Thank you, Marco. It's a pleasure to uh, be here today to moderate uh, a panel uh, of uh, distinguished speakers after uh, a keynote uh, um, by uh, my colleague uh, John Armour. So today's focus is actually only on three of the provisions uh, in uh, the new proposal. Uh, and the, the reason why our focus is so narrow is that uh, potentially these are very significant uh, uh, um, uh, rules that may be introduced if this proposal is adopted. Uh, so, uh, uh, and in addition to that, uh, one of them is also quite separate in terms of content from the rest of the provisions in the proposal. I'm talking specifically about uh, Article 25 on the director's duty of care, which is broader in scope than the rest of the directive. It's not about uh, supply chains. It's not about uh, uh, climate change and net zero plans. It, it's uh, much broader. Um, in addition to that, this is the stakeholder oriented stick, so to speak, in the proposal. There is also a specific uh, uh, carrot uh, that uh, the, the proposal is, is going to, to mandate in, in some circumstances about uh, <clears throat> remuneration. And I'm talking now about Article 15, Paragraph 3, which uh, 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 require companies to duly take into account the fulfillment of uh, the obligations uh, on having a net uh, zero uh, plans uh, and, or, or, uh, or anyhow to, to have uh, um, uh, yes, net zero plans uh, when setting variable remuneration. If variable remuneration is linked to the contribution of a director to the company's business strategy and long-term interest and sustainability. Finally, there is a specific duty that is imposed on the board of directors, uh, which is uh, this time uh, very much related to the core uh, aspects of this uh, proposal, that is the uh, sustainability uh, due diligence uh, that companies are required to, to put in place. And uh, Article 26 uh, specifies that uh, it is actually the directors of the companies covered by the directive that are responsible for putting in place and overseeing the due diligence actions referred to in Article 4. So as I anticipated, uh, the keynote uh, speech that uh, will uh, give us uh, an overview on these three topics is by uh, John Armour, the professor of law and finance at the University of Oxford and an ECGI fellow. I would um, give the floor to him immediately and introduce the panelists after his uh, uh, presentation. John, the floor is yours. Thanks uh, very much, Luca. Uh, so um, what I'm gonna cover is uh, broadly as follows. I'm gonna say uh, a little bit about the proposed law uh, that the, in, the, uh, the direct, in the proposal for a directive vis-a-vis -vis director's duties. I'm then going to uh, try to drill down a little bit and say what, um, what, what actually uh, might be in store for directors of companies were this to be uh, brought into force. What would it mean in practice? What would be the, the, the practical scope of the liability risk and the things that they would need to do uh, in order to avoid that? Uh, I'm then going to say a little bit about normative considerations, uh, although that's really just an opening salvo. And I know that the panel are going to probably have a lot more to say 
about this, then I'm going to uh, say a little bit about the remuneration uh, proposal and then uh, briefly wrap up. Uh, so let's jump in then with the proposed law in relation to duties. These are from the uh, Commission's uh, proposal for a directive on corporate sustainability uh, due diligence. Now, um, I'm going to begin by just covering some ground that was uh, retreading some ground that was covered yesterday uh, much better th than I can do, but um, it will become clear that these uh, the, the, the corporate obligations that are imposed uh, as respect or would be imposed as respect of uh, due diligence are, I think, foundational to the uh, potential liability for directors. Uh, and so it's, it's crucial, I think, to, to just to reiterate what those uh, corporate obligations uh, would be. Uh, so we can begin by looking at the scope of the companies that would be included in the proposal. Uh, there are uh, companies within the EU which are large, having more than 500 employees or 150 million euros turnover, or uh, companies that are substantial within the EU, uh, 250 uh, employees, 40 million uh, turnover, and in a, a sector that has high risk for uh, human rights or environmental uh, violations, so primary industries, extractive industries, textiles, clothing. Uh, and then uh, similar criteria um, applied to non-EU companies by virtue of their scale of their operations within uh, the EU. And then the, the due diligence uh, obligations, there's a suite of measures uh, that broadly speaking, uh, and I'll, I'll summarize this very quickly, uh, require companies to integrate due diligence into their policies, their code of conduct, compliance measures, requires them to scope out uh, the uh, actual and potential adverse impacts of the human of the, of the firm's activities on uh, human rights and the environment. And that's both within the entity itself, uh, its subsidiaries, uh, and then uh, down uh, its supply chain uh, through uh, partners with whom it has established business relationships. Uh, it's got to uh, take actions to prevent or mitigate uh, potential adverse impacts that the scoping exercise identifies and to end or minimize uh, adverse impacts that have actually uh, occurred. Um, now, the key point uh, that Marco mentioned and which was discussed extensively yesterday is that adverse impacts uh, has a very specific definition in this context. It's not a free floating concept. It's linked to uh, the specific human rights and environmental uh, uh, legislation, international uh, 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 law provisions that are set out in the annex uh, to the proposed directive. Uh, and so adverse impacts are things that actually cause harm to people, but involve a violation of one of those specific provisions. So there's a, there's a fixed list of uh, types of things that are capable of constituting adverse impacts. The firm has to have a complaints process in place so that uh, people who, who are adversely affected or uh, their representatives uh, can, uh, can bring a complaint. It has to have a policy for monitoring the effectiveness or has to have a mechanism for monitoring the effectiveness of its policies and actions. Uh, and it will have to report annually uh, on its due diligence uh, activity. So those are the corporate due diligence obligations. Um, there's also uh, in Article 15, uh, this uh, requirement for corporate transition plans. So large EU companies, that is companies with more than 500 employees, more than 150 million turnover in the EU, uh, have to uh, draw up uh, transition plans that are compatible with limit limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C. That is compatible uh, with uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, and the plan where the company's uh, operations uh, are such that uh, climate change is a principal risk for them. Uh, so firms that might be um, impacted by climate change uh, uh, because uh, their activities are vulnerable uh, to uh, weather related uh, uh, events, or uh, more significantly, I think, uh, in terms of the, uh, the costs to the firm, the impact of the company's operations. That is where the company's operations themselves are causative of, uh, of, of or having a, a serious contribution to uh, climate change. So, so fossil fuel uh, companies and, and so forth, um, are, um, are, they will then need to, uh, in their plan, include uh, emission reduction objectives. Um, enforcement for these measures, these corporate obligations, um, is a mixture of public and private enforcement. So supervi national supervisory authorities have to be designated by member states to supervise compliance. 
so uh, they would have to take complaints, uh, investigations, engage in inspections and uh, visit administrative sanctions on companies for violations of national provisions, but implement the due diligence and uh, climate plan uh, provisions. Uh, there's also in Article 22 uh, provision for civil liability for the company uh, for corporate failure to prevent uh, uh, or end adverse impacts uh, under the um, uh, relevant provisions uh, uh, that are listed in the annex. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, in both these channels of uh, public and private uh, liability, uh, there is uh, uh, a framework for giving companies incentives to uh, engage in meaningful uh, compliance investment, that is an investment in their due diligence processes an investment in the personnel to oversee that and in the incentives of the people working in the firm. Um, and that it comes out in articles 22 uh, and 22.2, where it says due account should be taken of the company's efforts to comply with any remedial action required of them by a supervisory authority, any investments made, any targeted support provided, as well as collaboration with other entities to address adverse impacts in its value chain. So, that, that is due account in the quantification of liability for both the public and private channel. So essentially, this tracks uh, a phenomenon that's been very common uh, in the US and has spread out to some other countries, which is that in the context of, uh, of firms that have been found uh, liable for uh, violations of obligations uh, to uh, wider society, if the firm has engaged in a compliance program to try to uh, reduce the likelihood of that uh, uh, misconduct occurring, then the firm can give in credit for that uh, when it comes time uh, to quantify the liability. Uh, and Jennifer Arlen, uh, I think, has the uh, seminal piece on this where she analyzes this uh, as a carrot uh, that gives the firm a clear incentive to invest in compliance. Because without this kind of carrot, without a reduced uh, liability, conditional on the firm having invested in compliance activity, uh, then an investment in compliance is, is ambiguous for firm value because an investment in compliance will reduce the likelihood of misconduct occurring, but it will also increase the probability of detecting misconduct. Uh, and so the net impact on the firm is ambiguous. But by giving this discount uh, for corporate penalties, it disambiguates that. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, comes across clearly uh, in, the, uh, in the proposal. So what responsibility directors have? Well, there are two provisions uh, relevant to the director's responsibility. So Article 26 specifically says that member states shall ensure that directors of companies are responsible for putting in place and overseeing the due diligence actions referred to in Article 4 and the due diligence policy in Article 5. Uh, and member states then uh, under Article 26.2 shall ensure that directors take steps to adapt the corporate strategy to take into account uh, the things that are identified in the scoping of due diligence and measures taken pursuant to articles seven to nine. So this is saying that the directors have responsibility for the uh, for making sure that the the corporate uh, that the resources necessary to meet the corporate obligations for due diligence are delivered uh, and to oversee uh, those uh, uh, to, to, to oversee uh, that activity. Then uh, under Article 25, there is a, a separately worded uh, duty, um, which I would characterize as a duty to consider sustainability. So member states shall ensure that when fulfilling their duty to act in the best interest of the company, directors of companies referred to in Article uh, 2.1, that is within scope, take into account the consequences of their decisions for sustainability matters, including where applicable human rights, climate change, and environmental consequences, including in the short, medium, and long term. Uh, member states shall ensure that their laws, regulations and administrative provisions providing for a breach of director's duties apply also to the provisions of this article. So what we've got then is a specific measure allocating responsibility, that's the word used, uh, for the implementation and oversight of uh, compliance with the corporate due diligence obligations uh, to the uh, directors. Uh, and uh, there is also this uh, distinct uh, separately worded duty uh, to take into account uh, the consequences of directors' decisions for sustainability matters. Uh, and this is not linked, uh, at least on the face of it, to these specific due diligence obligations. So um, it's worth noting that there is a, a definition of directors in the proposal, which encompasses both uh, independent and uh, independent directors. Um, so the directors in the, in the sense that we understand it in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the US context, most directors are 
uh, independence. Uh, but it also encompasses executives uh, who perform uh, senior managerial roles. So this, this definition of, dis of directors encompasses both uh, supervisory directors and management directors. Uh, so uh, there's both uh, supervision and execution uh, in the uh, scope of these, uh, these provisions. So let's now look at the uh, liability risk uh, that this, uh, these provisions may create for uh, people uh, involved in the management of the company. And I just want to begin this by referring to a piece that um, Bernard Black, Brian Cheffins and Mike Klausner published a few years ago, um, where they looked at the uh, incidence of out-of-pocket uh, costs to directors of US public companies. And they concluded that even in a, a very high uh, uh, litigation environment uh, characterized by the US, the, um, uh, the, the circumstances in which directors actually have to put their hands into their pockets were uh, very rare. So what, we, what I'm going to do is try to um, drill down a little bit and say, well, how much uh, actual uh, uh, impact are these provisions likely to have if implemented as drafted on those running companies? And I think the first starting point is to say, well, who can enforce them? Um, now, unlike the corporate liability provisions, uh, there is no provision for the director's duties uh, for enforcement by harmed parties, uh, which is the private uh, liability for corporations under Article 22, or for national supervisory authorities, um, which is the public enforcement mechanism for corporate uh, obligations under Article 20. So given that there are no new uh, enforcement channels, then uh, the standard enforcement channels will be used. And in fact, uh, Article 25.2 uh, talks about embedding this in member states' rules about directors' duties. So directors' duties are uh, understood to be owed to the company uh, and enforceable by the shareholders collectively. Um, so in order to um, bring uh, an action for breach of duty, there needs to be some loss uh, to the company or to the shareholders. Uh, and so where are we going to find a loss to the company uh, associated with a violation of these new duties? Uh, and this is where I think the new duties uh, will uh, have to be founded on, uh, to a large extent, the corporate obligations, or in some sense, another way of describing it is to say that these duties will create a sort of secondary liability for directors associated with the, the potential primary liabilities for companies under the corporate due diligence uh, and climate plan obligations. So because directors' liability is to the company, then there will only be uh, a, 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 um, a trigger for liability if the company suffers a loss uh, through uh, lack of care by the directors uh, in their oversight of, uh, of due diligence uh, or in their care uh, in sustainability review. Um, and here, it seems to me that we don't need to have these two distinct provisions. Uh, so in a sense, uh, what, what I'm going to argue is that the Article 25 uh, sustainability duty uh, does adds very little at all uh, to the um, uh, Article 26, uh, due diligence oversight responsibility. Um, we might say that the, the oversight responsibility um, doesn't, uh, doesn't itself um, specify uh, that, it is, it, it, that, there is a, that there is a duty or a, a liability associated with it. And in some sense, it might be that Article 25 is therefore uh, framed as a duty, whereas Article uh, 26 is framed as an allocation of responsibility. That might be some way of, of making sense of the relationship between the two of them. Um, but I think it, it must be understood that Article 26 brings with it um, an expectation that in overseeing this or in discharging this responsibility, directors would exercise uh, a relevant uh, degree of care. Uh, that is the degree of care that would be expected of them under their ordinary uh, national law uh, duties. And so uh, then when we put that alongside Article 25, it doesn't seem to me that Article 25 does very much more uh, than that for the reasons which I'm, I'm going to try and um, uh, explain now. So when would uh, a failure to, uh, uh, or, or failures in, sustain, in reviewing sustainability uh, cause loss to the company? Um, well, on the one hand, uh, if it triggers a liability to the company, uh, and most obviously that could be triggered through failures of due diligence, leading to adverse, uh, 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 which, are, which are associated with adverse impacts under Article 3, which result in sanctions uh, public sanctions or, or private law liability for the company under Articles 20 or 22. So if the corporate obligations lead to the company having to make a payout or having to remedy something uh, which uh, is, is costly for the company, then there's a corporate loss. 
Uh, and that then uh, could be something which could be uh, a liability for the board uh, if their lack of care had had a causal role in creating that loss. Similarly, um, if a failure to implement a climate change plan under Article 15 attracts some kind of uh, sanction from the National Supervisory Authority under Article 20, uh, that too is a corporate loss uh, that could attract uh, liability. But it seems to me hard to see uh, how harms to third parties that are caused uh, 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 other than through the violation of the uh, measures that are implemented uh, in, in the due diligence directive or elsewhere uh, in national laws uh, would create a loss to the company. Uh, and so if there's no loss to the company, then it seems hard to see how the uh, directors could face any liability. Uh, so uh, if we uh, then, one thought we might have is we might say, well, what about reputational losses? Maybe, maybe even if there's no uh, breach of the law uh, and there is therefore no liability that the company faces that we can quantify as the loss to the company, um, maybe the company's reputation is harmed by a failure to take into consideration uh, sustainability matters uh, and that then uh, triggers um, a, a loss to the company uh, uh, his reputation. Well, there's, there's, there's at least there are lots of different ways that we can uh, characterize corporate reputation. Um, one of them is to think about parties' willingness to trade uh, with a firm. Uh, and there's a literature on this uh, uh, in economics, um, that is a principal result of which is that uh, the willingness of um, uh, people to trade with the firm is, uh, is harmed by uh, misconduct uh, that has an adverse impact on customers or investors in the firm, um, but that there doesn't seem to be any impact uh, beyond uh, legal liabilities of the firm uh, for harms to third parties. Um, uh, and so uh, environmental harms, for example, uh, would fall into that category. Uh, and so that doesn't seem to be a, 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 a particularly promising source of potential loss to the company uh, outside of uh, some sort of corporate liability. Uh, you might then think of reputation in a second sense, which is political backlash. And a very salient uh, current example of this is Peter Hebblethwaite, the chief executive of P&O Ferries, who's getting uh, hammered by the UK government at the moment. They're telling him he should resign um, because the firm uh, sacked all its employees or sacked all its ferry workers, and then is, is trying to hire back people on, on, on agency uh, um, uh, work uh, for, for a much, much lower cost. Um, but this, this attracted political opprobrium because it was a violation of the obligation to consult with the workers uh, under the collective redundancy directive or under its uh, 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 continuing uh, uh, equivalent in, uh, in English law now. Um, if, if, if there's been no violation of the law, uh, then it seems uh, less likely that there will be such a significant uh, political backlash. Uh, and so, again, the reputational impact in terms of political backlash, I think, is uh, is likely to be most intense where there is um, a violation of uh, uh, a legal provision, such as those that are embedded in the uh, corporate obligations of the of the directive proposal. Um, so, what about um, climate plans? I think this is even this is even more problematic because um, we've got uh, the first proposition might be that you know, climate transition plans may, uh, in some cases, be consistent with firm value maximization. So, so a firm may not need uh, to be pushed to come up with a transition plan because the firm may conclude that it's actually uh, value maximizing to engage in transition. This, this depends on the, the perceptions of those uh, running the firm about the pace of change of renewables technology, about the likely future implementation of carbon taxes, um, which will affect the costs of different types of energy. It also uh, depends on the preferences uh, of ESG investors and the composition of its, of its shareholder base. What Article 15 does is it creates a push uh, on top of this uh, 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 firm level analysis that one would expect to be going on anyway, to develop a Paris compatible transition plan, apparently regardless of the impact on the firm's value. Uh, and failure to do so, it appears, may trigger some corporate sanctions from national supervisory authorities under Article 20. But of course, the implementation of a Paris compatible plan may itself trigger a bigger decline in value for the firm 
through operating losses. So if the firm has got to shift away from uh, carbon, uh, that may be very, very expensive for the firm. And so that that in itself could be a loss for the firm that could come from a decision to implement a, uh, a, a climate plan. So Article 25, I think, implies uh, some balancing of these considerations, taking into account the considerations for uh, the uh, environment environment as part of the uh, director's evaluation of the interests of the company. Uh, and it seems to me hard to make sense of how this balancing is going to, uh, going to occur, apart from thinking of it as um, the Article 15 obligation, to the extent that failure to comply with that will create a, a loss to the company through liability, um, is something that has to be weighed in the balance uh, where the uh, the firm is uh, uh, it, it, it is assessing um, its uh, its transition. So on the one hand, it may be costly for the firm to engage in transition, but on the other hand, it'll be costly for the firm not to have a climate plan uh, if there is liability uh, uh, under Article 20. And so th those is it, it, a sort of a tipping of the scales uh, in favour of transition. So um, there are problems with causation, I think, uh, showing uh, that, that, that oversight uh, issues at the board level uh, actually cause losses. So emissions are always harder to show causation for. Um, acts of third parties, business partners, again, difficult to show. Uh, and then questions of scale. So to what extent does the, the macro level oversight or lack of it by the board actually cause, uh, have a causative uh, impact on micro level instances of misconduct? Um, so those those things, I think, will make it uh, will will, will uh, focus the scope of liability on things that actually cause losses to the firm. So we will see uh, directors, therefore, um, in, uh, uh, in 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 uh, complying with a duty of this sort, uh, would be uh, focusing their attention on the things that give rise to corporate liabilities or potentially could give rise to corporate liabilities. So it would reinforce the corporate obligations. Uh, created by the or that would be created by the proposal. The actual intensity of liability would be, I think, mitigated considerably uh, by uh, the availability of DNO insurance, direct and officers insurance. This is not mentioned at all in the proposal, um, and so that I assume would therefore be something that would be uh, dealt with under uh, national law. Uh, and there's there's some variation in in national laws uh, amenability to the use of DNO insurance. But what what it does where it's in place is it reduces the downside uh, liability risk for directors, but it introduces a repeat player, namely the insurer, uh, that has an incentive to monitor uh, the performance of the due diligence tasks that might trigger uh, liability. And then, of course, there are civil procedure rules uh, for uh, 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 that, that, that um, uh, create barriers to enforcement of directors' duties. Uh, and so we need to ask what standing requirements exist in national law for, for a derivative action. Is there an owner th ownership threshold, for example? That's a, that's a barrier to enforcement. What criteria do courts use to determine whether a derivative action can proceed? How easy is it for claimants to obtain an indemnity from the company for the fees of the, of the litigation? And some research I did a few years ago uh, with uh, Bernie Black, Brian Cheffins and Richard Nolan, we, we investigated the incidence of, of, of suits against directors of public companies in the UK. Uh, and we found there was just zero litigation uh, against uh, directors. Uh, and we concluded that the um, uh, civil procedure rules were the most uh, likely barrier uh, to lawsuits. So the actual, uh, the actual on the ground incidence of liability risk is likely to be uh, very modest, um, uh, at least through uh, private enforcement. So then um, what about normative consideration? Is it desirable to give directors duties uh, to uh, oversee um, uh, due diligence uh, in, in the firm and to uh, engage in uh, sustainability review. Well, um, I, I've argued um, in a paper a couple of years ago with uh, Jeff Gordon and Jiang Min that um, personal liability for those uh, for boards vis-a-vis -vis compliance uh, is, is, is probably a good thing. Um, and the argument was uh, 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 essentially as follows that um, investment in compliance or due diligence activity is an immediate cost to the company, um, whereas liabilities for failures uh, in due diligence and compliance are likely to be long term. So the, the, the problems are not likely to emerge immediately, they're likely to take some time to emerge. And, you know, a simplistic way to think about this is to say, well, uh, what would, you know, what the, the, the return on the investment in uh, compliance from the point of view of firm value is the uh, expected 
uh, liability discounted by the probability of enforcement. But the long-term characteristic of it becomes clear um, if you realize that the cumulative probability of enforcement is increasing. Uh, so that is the expected cost of failure to engage in compliance increases over time. The longer you leave it, the more likely the firm is to have a problem. Uh, and so uh, that creates uh, an issue uh, around potential short termism for those who are running the firm, um, because uh, it may be very hard for investors to verify the quality of the firm's investment in compliance. Uh, and so consequently, uh, the market would likely uh, devalue the expected return on the firm's um, uh, investment and, 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 and likely not appreciate fully uh, the extent to which this uh, cumulative probability of enforcement has been reduced. So the um, people running the firm may maximize the stock price in the short run by skimping on compliance. Uh, if their time horizon uh, is shorter than the time horizon over which uh, the um, uh, cumulative probability of enforcement grows. And so as an example, um, what, we've, what we've got here is a, a, a couple of lines showing how the expected cost of a, of a liability grows over time when you take into account the cumulative probability of enforcement. Uh, and if uh, somebody has only got a five-year time horizon, they may not uh, uh, fully uh, invest uh, enough resources to, uh, uh, from the firm's point of view, uh, make that uh, 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 to, to, to um, uh, mitigate that potential liability uh, as would be desirable. So that then, uh, li personal liability for uh, for directors and officers can help to uh, mitigate under in, under investment in compliance, but it obviously creates a, a, a potential counter effect, which is um, because it, if we're imposing personal liability, but the, the, the directors are spending corporate funds uh, to uh, invest in compliance activity, then we may get overinvestment in compliance. So lots and lots of compliance activity that isn't or due diligence activity that, that is, is just getting in the way of the firm uh, doing its business. Uh, and I think these uh, overinvestment concerns can be mitigated by uh, reducing the probability of enforcement or capping uh, the amount of liability, and, and we proposed in the US context capping the amount, and I think in the European context, the probability of enforcement is very modest, uh, and so that would be, uh, 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 you know, I'd be less concerned about um, overinvestment. Quickly, let me say a few words about um, climate remuneration before I stop. So um, Article 15.3 provides that director remuneration must take into account the fulfillment of the obligations referred to in Articles 15, 1 to 2, that is uh, the, uh, the, the um, transition plan uh, obligations, um, if variable remuneration is linked to the contribution of a director to the company's business strategy and long-term interest and sustainability. So that condition, if variable remuneration is linked to the contribution of a director to the company's business strategy and long-term interest and sustainability, that seems to me uh, a very abstruse uh, wording. Uh, and it's hard to know, uh, you know, could you, for example, say that this doesn't apply if the director's remuneration is not linked to the company's uh, long-term interests? Uh, that would be a pretty disastrous interpretation uh, because you would uh, give people an incentive to create compensation plans that would be problematic for other reasons. So I think the only sensible interpretation is that this means any variable uh, remuneration scheme. So if there's variable remuneration, uh, the uh, commissioner is saying, well, they think that it ought to be, um, uh, linked to the contribution of the business strategy and long-term interest and sustainability. Having said that, this uh, I think is a largely, or as it's drafted, is a largely hortatory provision. Um, so the scope or the extent of the linkage between the variable remuneration and the uh, director's uh, 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 contribution is not specified. Moreover, it's excluded from the uh, purview of supervision and enforcement by national supervision or supervisory authorities under Article 17.1, and there's no civil liability under Article 22. So there's no, there's no, there's, there's no liability for a company that doesn't actually uh, implement this mechanism. And so uh, this seems to me then uh, a much lighter touch than what's being applied in the other components that I've talked about. Uh, and so it seems that this creates scope for the implementation of these sorts of measures uh, to be steered by, say, on pay votes, which are required, of course, under the shareholder rights to directive. Um, or the uh, more recent phenomenon 
uh, of some activist investors seeking uh, say on climate votes uh, and that these uh, responses from shareholders might help to steer the firm in, in coming up with uh, uh, a linkage um, uh, of, of climate remuneration um, that is uh, compatible uh, with its business model. So just to summarize quickly, the scope for a sustainability uh, due diligence liability for directives, I think, largely would track the underlying scope for corporate uh, liability. Um, I think the director's liability risk will be modest, um, but it would focus attention on corporate actions uh, in respect of due diligence compliance. For climate plans, this would be more of a nudge set against other impacts on firm value. The desirability of this uh, uh, liability initiative depends, I think, on whether we uh, regard underinvestment or overinvestment in uh, due diligence as a bigger problem. Uh, it seems to me, at least, that underinvestment is, is, is more likely uh, as a starting point. Um, and I think the climate remuneration provisions are largely hortatory, um, but they uh, may interact with uh, shareholder activism, as I've suggested. Thank you, John. It was a great presentation. And um, I, without uh, uh, commenting on, on the many, many insights that you uh, have given us, because we have a Q&A session later on, to which I uh, refer also for the uh, various Q uh, questions that have been posted on the Q&A, I would um, give the floor uh, first uh, to Mariana Pargrendler, who is a professor of law at Fundação Getulio Vargas Law School in Sao Paulo uh, and global professor of law at uh, New York University School of Law, in addition to being uh, an ECGI research member. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes. So, um, Mariana, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, I I uh, will focus my remarks on three points. Uh, first, I would like to put uh, the directive in a broader context, and I'll talk a little bit about the ways of international corporate law. Uh, then I will uh, reflect on directors' duties by also taking into account other strategies of corporate law designed to tackle uh, external interests, including uh, climate change and human rights abuses. And, and finally, I will say a few words about uh, the directive's approach um, to regulating entities versus regulating enterprises and why I think this is a critical point that is uh, important generally and also related to director's duties. So first, in terms of uh, situating uh, the directive, I see it as part of a broader phenomenon, which I have called the rise of international corporate law. Uh, uh, it used to be the case that we thought a lot about comparative uh, corporate law. Mariana, but I, can you please uh, perhaps uh, put it on the slideshow, uh, the, your slides? Sorry. We are, we are not seeing the one you're talking about right now. So let me um, resume. Do you see it now, Luca? Yes, exactly, thank you. So, um, so there has been this shift uh, toward international corporate law with international organizations shaping the debate on corporate law and policy. And you can think about EU law as international corporate law or not, but here I would like to focus also on the role of other international organizations, uh, um, the OECD, but, but specifically also the UN. And um, in terms of interpreting this phenomenon, I suggest that there are externalities of the corporate law regimes uh, in different countries and also nationalistic tendencies of these national regimes, which then international corporate law seeks to counter. Uh, some of these relate to shareholder value, relating to the pre presence of foreign investors, but others uh, relate to broader uh, social and economic and environmental externalities, such as systemic risk, human rights abuses, environmental protection, uh, and the like. Um, in terms of the UN's involvement, I would trace uh, everything that we are seeing in the directive, or a whole lot of it, to a initiative by Kofi Annan and a speech he gave in Davos in 1999, a whole 
a, a long time ago, in which he proposed a global contact, compact calling for businesses to, to uphold human rights, labor, and environmental standards. He said that unless minimum standards came to prevail in global markets, the global economy would be vulnerable to backlash from all sorts of isms, protectionism, populism, nationalism, ethnic chauvinism, fanaticism, and terrorism. And as a Ruggi, um, uh, later described, he was really worried about addressing the governance gaps uh, of globalization. And going back to John's uh, point, he says, is there a, a overinvestment or underinvestment? This is a diagnosis of underinvestment, which I, which I believe still holds. Um, we have seen uh, really uh, United Nations sponsored shock in a corporate governance and discourse. Um, there is the, the, the age of ESG, which came from a global compact initiative. It is indeed very curious that ESG is not even uh, specifically addressed in this directive since they are part of the same uh, normative project. And you have the concept of human rights uh, due diligence, which was a key part of uh, the guiding principles on business and human rights uh, conceived by uh, UN representative John Ruggi. And the idea there was really recruiting businesses and investors to help fill the government's gaps of globalization. And, and beyond that, leading to a progressive hardening of standards. I think it was part and parcel of the project to also um, uh, prompt companies and investors to push for uh, regulatory uh, change. Uh, the initial Ruggie report um, raised uh, skeptic had a skeptical reaction initially from uh, Wachtell Lipton, a, a major U.S. firm that viewed as potentially uh, having potentially harmful implications for global business. Um, at the same time, there was a memo uh, by um, Well Gottschall. I worked there at the time together with partner uh, Ira Nilsson, which then who then um, uh, framed the defense of this initiative as leveling the playing field. Wachtell since uh, embraced the, the idea of leveling the playing field and the idea of leveling the playing field appears uh, repeatedly throughout um, the EU directive. So uh, corporate uh, governance is being harnessed to address the governance gaps of globalization to uh, mitigate human rights abuses and, and, um, and also climate change and other environmental problems. And that is different from what I have called the modularity approach to line economics, which views the legal system as being formed by different areas of law. And they, in this modular conception, each area of law would have a specialized objective. The specialized objective of corporate law being the reduction of agency costs and the specialized objective of antitrust law being consumer welfare and, and, and of um, tort law of reducing the cost of accidents and so on and so forth. And, and I just want to, to say here, that uh, this modularity approach is in crisis. We see that <laughs> because we're having this debate now in the, con in the context of corporate law, but corporate law is not alone. <laughs> if you, we were talking about antitrust law, also in the EU context, we would see that this modularity approach is also in crisis. I think people feel that the, the environmental and social problems of our time are so urgent that all fields should help out <laughs> any way they can. And, 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 and interestingly, um, uh, develop, developing countries um, uh, have for some time had a less modular, more heterodox um, approach as well. So in, in this way, these problems are not so urgent in, in the global north. Uh, they have long been urgent in the global south and, and other fields of law have been um, called uh, to address broader problems. Uh, one problem with the traditional modular approach to corporate law is that first there are uh, governance gaps uh, in the international arena because you have national laws in a, in a, in a global economy. But I would also like to highlight uh, the participation of corporate law through legal personality and um, permitting and encouraging such um, corporate governance gaps. Uh, legal personality is associated with asset partitioning, limited liability, which is associated with the externalization of risk, 
uh, Alessia discussed that in greater length uh, yesterday. And there's also legal per personality. And here I'm thinking about the foreign subsidiaries that are part and parcel of the governance gap. They also um, have what I term regulatory partitioning. They are considered to be legally distinct uh, for other legal effects. Uh, including uh, jurisdiction. Um, so uh, uh, and so so corporate law does play a role itself um, in, in in those uh, governance gaps. And then you have a question about what to do about it. And I think it's helpful to 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 look at the various different strategies offered uh, by corporate law um, to uh, put uh, the issue of directors' duties and liability into perspective. Of course, one, one area is disclosure. The EU has been uh, moving with non-financial disclosure for some time right now. The SEC is discussing new rules on, on uh, climate change uh, related disclosure. I think there is a sense that disclosure is helpful, um, but you cannot uh, place all your bets on disclosure. So what else is it um, that uh, one could do? And, and clearly the directive, uh, uh, provides for broader director duties by specifically mentioning consideration of human rights, climate change, uh, the environment. Um, my take uh, on that, I think, is 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 it's it's similar to John's. I think um, uh, for many non corporate law scholars and maybe even for directors themselves, broader duties might seem very scary. There's might have there might be a a sentiment that this is really overkill and 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 so and and and, and so scary and it will create over deterrence. I think another potential problem with this mechanism is precisely the risk of under deterrence. Actually, um, uh, director uh, liability is often rare. I think the broader the duties, maybe the harder it is to hold directors liable for 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 anything. So I think this is. Um, I think uh, this is such a difficult question, and and my point really here is that there are other lower hanging fruits that the directive could have gone after. So another thing about directors' liability, and this was mentioned by John, is that directors already have, in in many if not most jurisdictions, liability for oversight obligations. This means that if there are hard duties and liabilities on the company, there is also a, there's already a venue for um, for a director liability. And I think this is really interesting, and this is and this really creates um, really the need for um, hard. Uh, harder or hard uh, avenues for liability uh, and, and sanctions. Um, the, direct, uh, the directive also discusses director uh, remuneration. I um, agree with um, uh, John's uh, characterization of it's largely hortatory. Um, so uh, my inclination would be really to focus on um, on uh, liability, either company liability or really looking closer at the system of administrative law enforcement. We know that in the evolution of the concept of human rights due diligence, we saw different phases. Uh, it was soft law under the guiding principles. Then there were a number of disclosure initiatives. Then you had initiatives focused on liability, such as French law regime, based on a duty of vigilance and some of that appears in the directive but but now we're really in a new wave of a, an, ad, an administrative apparatus of of enforcement and i think administrative enforcement is helpful but no substitute uh, for liability the risk of arbitrage uh, based on national enforcers was already referred to yesterday. Uh, the law and economics literature suggests that companies might have an information advantage. So liability has the benefit of having the most informed party make um, make the calculations and and uh, about uh, what actions um, uh, to take. And I will also want to focus the issue of distribution and really equity um, in around the world, because in terms of liability, um, that would mean damages 
in many cases uh, to parties harmed in the global south, whereas in terms of administrative enforcement, it would be fines to regulators in the global north. So I think this is another argument in favor of um, liability. And yet I am um, disappointed by the directive stance on liability. It's Sounds kind of broad. It says, well, companies and subsidiaries will be liable, but I don't think it actually goes far enough. I think it's too constrained by a certain perception and, and, and Ruggie uh, kind of articulated it very clearly. He says, well, it's, it's a very hard sell to have enterprise liability, which me meaning uh, parents being automatically liable for uh, harm caused by subsidiaries. And, and then he didn't want to go that way. But he says, well, when people think about like duties and risk management and oversight, um, it is the case that companies already take an, an enterprise approach. And I think that's more or less where, where, the, directive, um, where the directive is. Um, but, but I think it's worth thinking about whether that really makes sense in terms of reading the law and economics literature, I think I read it like Alessio did yesterday. I think there is, if not complete, uh, I think a significant consensus that uh, limited liability is high, with respect to tort, uh, to tort victims is highly problematic in corporate groups. And, and yet the directive um, does not create parent company liability for acts of subsidiaries, but rather imposes liabilities on parent companies for their own acts in having failed to um, be vigilant and engage in diligence with respect to their operations and the subsidiaries. So I see this as, 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 as really a low-hanging fruit. So the directive seems to be go, going further in areas where there's less consensus and, and, and yet it's highly restrictive restrictive here, and I think this would be helpful because that would also have, um, I think, implications about how directors um, uh, manage this firm so as not to unduly externalize, um, so not, not to ex unduly externalize uh, risk. Uh, I think the whole uh, treatment of enterprise versus entity in the directive is, is very odd. I think the trigger for coverage under the directive was mentioned yesterday in terms of being based on entities, not on groups. Uh, I think this is problematic. I think it's problematic in falling short of imposing automatic uh, parent company liability and also access to jurisdiction, which is something distinct from liability itself, but I think very critical uh, to enforcement of harm caused by foreign subsidiaries. But it does cover in modified fashion supply chain uh, problems. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's, it's a step in the right direction in terms of um, um, avoiding arbitrage, uh, but perhaps there were uh, lower hanging fruits as well in terms of liability. So my really my conclusion is that director's duties are, are problematic. There's their fears of overkill, and I think really of underkill, I'm, I'm quite concerned about uh, underkill uh, here. I think there are important benefits of liability uh, compared to administrative control, and I think they, it's important that they be complements. And and I'm a bit disappointed about the directive stance, which is so bold in many ways with respect to liability for acts of foreign subsidiaries. And with that, I um, thank you and and my initial remarks. Thank you, Mariana. Um, great presentation. Uh, now we move on uh, immediately with uh, René Adams, uh, Professor of Finance at Said Business School at the University of Oxford and ECGI Fellow. René, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Luca. All right, so um, I've studied corporate directors my entire academic career. And I have to say, when I read the proposal, um, I did not recognize the directors. Um, and I'm going to uh, take two statements that I struggled with and, and just to, to illustrate the point. Um, so the, the first statement is um, a statement that's contained in the Ernst and Young study on directors' duties, uh, which is one of the ma major research pieces that underlines the proposal. And uh, what they say in this Ernst and Young study is um, essentially that directors favor the short-term maximization of shareholder value. 
Um, and uh, it stated um, as if this were a fact, which, you know, as an academic, I already struggle with. Um, but uh, the reason I struggled with this statement generally is um, until very recently, the game and the corporate governance literature was essentially to argue that um, directors don't maximize shareholder value. Um, so there's a substantial body of literature arguing that directors don't maximize shareholder value. Now we're being told um, that actually they put too much attention on the shareholders, right? So, so there's an inconsistency there that, um, that I struggle with. Okay, the second statement is um, uh, the statement that essentially encapsulates uh, Article 25, um, which I've taken from the proposal fact sheet. Um, and so basically what this says is when fulfilling their duty, um, sorry, I just need to move my windows here. Um, when fulfilling their duty to act in the best interests of the company, directors must take into account the human rights, climate change, and the environmental consequences of their decisions, including in the long term. Well, if you read this statement, what it sort of suggests is that um, directors are not currently doing this, right? Because um, if they were doing it, we wouldn't need to have this proposal that says, well, we need to get these people to do it, right? Um, and this, uh, to me, contradicts some of the research uh, that I've been doing with uh, Amir Licht. Actually, it's research that we started at the Stockholm School of Economics in 2005 um, on how directors balance the interests of shareholders and stakeholders. Um, so I thought it might be useful to, to talk a bit about this research. Um, and basically, what Amir and I did, we, we, we were struggling with this idea. Is, well, how, how do directors balance the various interests that they're supposed to balance? And um, we said, well, let's try and measure this, um, see if we can measure this sort of tension that directors face. And um, what we, the, the way that we approach this measurement is we said, well, if the interests of shareholders and stakeholders are aligned, um, there's no discussion to be had, right? There, there's nothing interesting going on. So the only time this question is really interesting is when the, there's a conflict between the interests of shareholders and stakeholders. And so we said, well, well, when when can we tell that there's a conflict between um, shareholders and stakeholders? Well, we can observe conflicts in the law. OK, so basically what we did is we identified situations of conflict between shareholders and stakeholders using seminal court cases that involve conflicts. Um, and then we use these cases to derive vignettes. And then we surveyed directors with these vignettes and we said, well, if you were the director in this situation, how would you have decided? Okay, so the vignettes that we used were um, vignettes related to a conflict between um, shareholders and consumers, between shareholders and employees, between shareholders and creditors, and shareholders and the community. And we also uh, um, confronted directors with a corporate philosophy question, which essentially said, you know, what would you put on your website regarding the purpose of your corporation? Now, um, we, um, we developed this questionnaire and uh, we surveyed directors of listed firms in Sweden in 2006. Um, we also did a more recent survey where we surveyed directors of listed firms across countries. And um, in uh, my classroom, I've recently been implementing um, the same survey of uh, using Oxford MBA students. And I think it's interesting uh, to benchmark the directors against the students. Okay, so here what I'm showing you is um, uh, basically the, the raw data. So, so what we do, we, we develop the survey, we construct a measure of how much directors care about shareholders relative to stakeholders. And this measure is increasing the more you care about shareholders. Okay, so um, what I've plotted here is a histogram of this shareholderism measure. And it ranges from one to six. So if a director answer has a measure of six, that means they always side with shareholders. If a director has a value of one, that means they always side with stakeholders. So against the shareholders. And um, you know, in between means you sometimes side with shareholders, sometimes with stakeholders. And what you see from this histogram, uh, this is data from um, over a thousand director respondents in 23 countries. Um, what you see from this histogram is most of the mass is in the middle. So we don't actually observe that the directors are all over here, always siding with shareholders which is sort of what a lot of this discussion is assuming. 
Um, in fact, most of the directors are in the middle, which means in these various scenarios that we um, confronted them with, they would sometimes side with the shareholders or side with the shareholders as the court um, essentially ruled and sometimes side with the stakeholders. Um, now you could argue, well, okay, so they're, they're not all grouped over here um, in the, like always siding on the side of shareholders, uh, but maybe they're still too far on the side of shareholders, right? So now I'm gonna benchmark the directors against the Oxford MBA students. So why is this an interesting benchmark? Um, because uh, students who come to Oxford um, are, I would say, very socially conscious. Um, they are very um, dedicated. They're very interested in sustainability issues. We have many discussions about corporate purpose at Oxford. Um, they're very idealistic students, right? So, so you would think that, you know, these, these might be the students um, who in the future, um, and we hope these are the students who in the future are going to um, implement a lot of the, the changes that need to be made. Okay. So I, we confront the uh, students with the exact same questionnaire that we give the directors. And guess what? The students look exactly like the directors. So in my most recent survey, the mean difference between directors and students is tiny. The difference is not statistically significant at conventional levels. And the difference is also not economically significant. Now I've done this in 2022. I did this in 2021, I see the exact same pattern. The shape of the distribution is exactly the same. So what does this essentially tell you? It tells you that these directors struggle with these issues just as anyone in this position would struggle with these issues. Um, I don't think that um, our data suggests or that our results are consistent with this extremely negative view of um, how directors balance the interests of shareholders and stakeholders. Now, um, but you could argue, okay, so if we accept that maybe it's true, directors don't always side on the side of shareholders, um, but it's still important to have rules, right? Rules are good because um, they can't harm um, anything and um, maybe things will get better if we have rules. Okay, so um, we looked at this because we have a cross country sample and uh, what we show is that the law does not seem to be relevant for explaining variation in shareholderism across countries. Um, and just to illustrate this point, what I've done is on the left, I've plotted the histogram of shareholderism for the full sample of directors. And on the right, I have the histogram for the sample of US directors. Um, now, obviously, you know, the US is known for being the most shareholder friendly country um, yet what we see is that um, the U.S. directors look very similar um, to the directors um, in sort of a broader sample across 23 countries. Okay, so, and this is just a sort of a simple graphical uh, depiction of the data. You, we, in the analysis, we find no, um, we don't find that law actually has any effect on whether directors are more shareholder oriented or less shareholder oriented. Now, this doesn't mean that um, there's not something that can explain variation, because what you observe is there is variation in the data, right? So directors do um, seem to um, indicate different preferences for shareholders versus stakeholders. Uh, so if it's not the law, what is it? Um, so what we show is that personal characteristics and cultural characteristics are extremely important. So in particular, what we show is that directors with more other regarding values and directors in more other regarding cultures favor stakeholders and directors with more entrepreneurial values and directors in more sort of entrepreneurial cultures favor shareholders. We find this in the sample of directors. We also find similar results with the Oxford students. So you see the exact same pattern. So personal characteristics and where you're actually located make a big difference. But the where you're located is not, you know, what, what's important there seems to be culture and not necessarily the law. Um, so let me just wrap up. Uh, so I hope you can understand my ongoing frustration with the casual attitude towards research in the policy sphere. 
Um, I don't recognize the directors that the proposal um, discusses. I don't recognize um, the, the, the statements um, that is made about um, what we know about directors. I think um, we need to be much more circumspect about making such strong statements. Um, my own research with Amir Leif suggests that who directors are is more important than what the rules are. Now, we can say if the proposals lead directors to be more informed, which of course is a possibility, then obviously their decision making can improve. But I would argue, and I think some of the, the previous um, talks also highlights this point, that the proposals would clearly influence who becomes a director. Right, so um, if there's a change in the liability, if there's a change in um, the type of um, activities that directors are expected to carry out, that will have a big influence on who's actually willing to become a director. And it's not hard to imagine that um, this, these types of proposals might attract the wrong type of director, in which case the proposals won't achieve their objectives. So I look forward to um, discussing these issues more in um, more detail later. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rene. And um, lots of food for thought here. Uh, again, uh, we'll have the Q&A to uh, look in, into these issues. And, and now, Steen Thompson, that, that's, the floor is yours. Ste so, sorry, Steen is... Uh, uh, professor and founding chairman of the Center for Corporate Governance at the Copenhagen Business School and an ECGI research member. Thank you. I'll share some slides. You see them? Yes, but they are not in uh, in slideshow mode. No, but I see that it's working now. Yeah, working, right? We see the two, the next slide, slide as well. Okay. If you click on display settings and uh, invert, it'll be fine. Settings up at the top. No, uh, the top left. Yes, display setting. Okay. Invert. And then uh, what? the first one. Yeah. One. Swap. Swap. Work. Yeah. Good for you. Okay. One. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, remind everybody about the background, and particularly the need for uh, our work here to respect the EU's high ideals for better regulation. And then I'm going to look at some key points of the proposals, and I'm going to look at what I think are the likely effects. Now, to be sure, you know, the discussion here uh, uh, today has made me, um, you know, more calm, I would say. Uh, then uh, when I started uh, reading the directive, because I, I was been seriously worried that it would that the effect would be very dramatic and so on. But I'm I'm kind of very uh, assuaged when the, when the lawyers say, oh, it's not going to be that dramatic. It's going to be very much business as usual. Um, so let's hope that. Um, and and I, I really want to be persuaded that that's the case. Uh, but I'm going to assume that this is going to have an effect, and I'm going to try to to, to 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 try to assess what would be the likely effects, and I hope to be proved wrong. Uh, so basically, as you remember, there was a fierce criticism of the original report from EUI that Rene just mentioned, and um, uh, uh, it was also rejected by the regulatory scrutiny board, and uh, you know, so and 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 the. You know, assessment was that it was not, uh, there was no convincing evidence uh, that uh, EU businesses did not already take these things into consideration very much along what you said, Rene, uh, and uh, or that they, maybe they have all the incentives to do so as, as it is. And nevertheless, we find some of the same elements introduced in a su supply chain due diligence directive, which is kind of, you know, why, why, why there, you know, why not, and so on. And uh, I would say that this amounts to a violation of the EU's better regulation principles, which mandate evidence-based and transparent EU uh, lawmaking based on the views of those that may be affected. So this is kind of, uh, you know, we, we, I, I very much side with Rene. We need to see some evidence here and the evidence has to be solid. And it's no, you know, it's not enough just to say that this is politically important or that action is urgent or something. If, if we do the wrong thing, you know, in these situations, it's even more, more, more problematic. So um, what are some of the key points that I want to emphasize? There is, of course, the, the mandatory uh, climate plans, 
which you know it sounds less as a perfect idea but what company would not want to plan for a net zero um, and uh, you could say you know um, in in some sense it is uh, the parallel to uh, what economists would say the the ideal uh, first best principle would be here to impose a carbon tax but here instead of having a carbon tax we let the companies decide how they want to uh, approach net zero because we are going to end in 2050 by by net zero right for sure we know that and so the the trajectory of the you know the exact trajectory but we know the end goal and we're going to ask companies to devise such plans now you may say plans are plans you know they will not have much of an impact but you know i'm from a protestant country you know and we don't do plans which are you know meaningless you know so if we do the plans we're going to do something about it and that's perhaps why i would you know take offense because this is going to be costly for some companies and who is going to pay for these costs and why is it that we can just put it into company law that these costs should be afforded and you know where we don't have a discussion as if it was a tax so i see i see some issues there um, about climate incentives, you know, the idea that we can kind of mix climate incentives and shareholder incentives is there's an incredibly bad track record for complex incentive schemes. There's a long discussion in, in managerial economics about this. And I think, you know, what you'd find is that, um, you know, uh, best uh, either fixed pay, you know, which is what we already have in most cases for the non-execs, or uh, if you want something for the execs, you could have long-term ownership. Uh, on the assumption that over long long periods, you know, shareholders and stakeholder uh, uh, concerns tend to be more aligned, if they're not perfectly, at least much more aligned. It would be a kind of a better principle, a better way to kind of uh, make these ends meet. Then we have, you know, uh, some uh, duties, director's duties, which I'm going to focus on uh, later on. Uh, uh, but these, if, 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 the duties uh, are now to include climate action, human rights, and the environment. So I have to understand it as if they didn't include climate action, human rights, and the environment before. But some of the lawyers tell me, oh, they already did, you know, so there's really no problem, you know. And the EU Commission is saying it already did, you know, we don't require any alteration to, to uh, national company law. But I fail to see the point here. Why is it that it needs to be included in a directive if there is no effect or no alteration? So either strike it, you know, or, you know, you need to show what kind of, you know, uh, what is it specifically that we want to do more than a normal company law. And, you know, if there is something more than normal company law, then, you know, we are into an, a new situation where we have a conflict between, let's say, normal company law and, 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 and what we have here. Um, and this applies then uh, both to the, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the supply chain uh, due diligence, but it also applies to, to these issues uh, more generally. Um, and uh, going to director's duties, uh, I find it troubling that they are to now to include uh, the entire value chain, meaning, you know, if you think about it from cradle to grave, so to say, you know, here the product, you know, from raw material, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to semi-production, to production, you know, to, to distribution and, uh, and so on. And all these change, you know, uh, uh, levels or in, in the value chain, how, I mean, how can a company, you know, you know, let's say sourcing uh, something in a, in a foreign country, uh, how can a company ever understand the entire value chain, including not just the short-term effects, but also the long-term effects, you know, of what we do. Now, I know that in the supply chain due diligence, there is a kind of cap, you know, where you say, if you just do reasonable things, you know, then, you know, you should not be liable. But there is also kind of a qualification there, which basically says, you know, if somebody thinks later on that these things were not reasonable, then, you know, uh, it, it, directors should not be able to escape liability. And uh, it, it worries me a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, more, uh, less uh, worried when I hear John saying, yeah, it's only going to be when the share market reacts. But the thing is, also, uh, if the share market reacts, you know, and we have a loss, uh, uh, you know, this loss could come 10 years from now on a decision that we made, you know, and on something which we, you know, we, 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 we haven't really kind of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, ever th thought about it. We had no way of knowing and so on, but then it's our fault and so on. So I, I, I see this could be problematic. There's also the idea that we should have enhanced civil liability. 
so I think about the US and I think one of the things which makes me happy is that we don't have a US style litigation regime in Europe because we don't have to use unproductive time on this. And it's, uh, and it's not as if we are behind on at least the E and the S part of ESG. So, so actually we save costs on this. Uh, and it's one of the you know, more uh, less palatable uh, aspects of US corporate governance. Finally, we're going to have a, a sustainability regulator and, and uh, not just one, we're going to have many in the different countries, but they will be orchestrated by the commission in a network. And these regulators, by the way, they could be the national financial standard authorities. Uh, you know, and if you think about the role of the financial standard authority and what they're doing to the, to the banks and so on, the moment you see you know, a regulation tradition, which is yeah, uh, very, very difficult uh, for, 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 for banks at the moment, they spend all their time you know, doing compliance. Uh, and if the companies, uh, normal companies get into the same situation, I think we can kiss our competitors goodbye. Uh, so I, I, I see issues here, and um, uh, the regulators will hear NGO complaints, you know, and of course, and and uh, you know, bring them up with the companies, and they will also be able to impose pecuniary sanctions, or at least if that's not allowed, they will be able to ask the comp the court to to impose those sanctions. So um, so I see something here, which you know, it looks it, look, it looks to me dramatic, but uh, please show me that it's not. If now it does have an effect on director liability, you should know that there is a relatively large literature, a recent literature, which shows that there are large unintended effects of, of increasing director liability. Uh, you know, for example, uh, if you increase director liability, expert directors are more likely to exit, and this uh, can even be set or estimated to have an effect on, on firm value, um, negative. Um, uh, there, there's lower director quality, there's the experts directors which leave, uh, we have less innovation um, and we have uh, both in the input and the output. Uh, we have greater accounting conservatism. We have higher director pay to kind of compensate for the added liability. You know, there's a kind of quid pro quo here. Um, uh, it's true that there are also some, some evidence, there's also some evidence which has, but you do get higher ESG or CSR uh, ratings um, if the directors are not insured. There's an issue here which Rene, I'm sure, would love to pinpoint uh, about, uh, um, you know, endogeneity and so when are you insured and so on. But there is some evidence that, uh, that uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, limiting uh, liability here, uh, uh, you know, could also uh, uh, lead to, um, to more CSR. So uh, there was, uh, yesterday there was a study about, um, uh, you know, from the JF, uh, we mentioned with AK and Apple, which said that um, uh, there should be, uh, if you increase uh, uh, corporate liability, you have less pollution. But here we're not talking about director liability. We're increase, the study is talking about, uh, you know, uh, co corporate liability as such. In general, uh, my reading of the literature is that, it, that you know, direct liability as such is, it's not really, it's a problematic instrument. And that's also one reason why we're not so happy about it in Europe as, as people are in the US. And there's a paper by the, in the Cambridge Handbook of uh, Compliance in 2021, which basically addresses this question. Is it the case that we get something from tort? Does it work? And so on. And the authors go through a lot of studies on this. And with the exception of shareholder liability, you know, uh, actually direct liability towards shareholders, they find no deterrence. They also find a lot of unwanted effects, lower service, uh, defensive practices, higher costs, and so on. So, 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 uh, so if there is anything, you know, uh, in this directive which would substantially increase director liability, then we will, we are also likely to see some of these costs here, which could of course be be, be, be problematic. Uh, so, in that case, the likely consequences would be risk aversion and loss of dynamism. Um, and European competitors, for example, as uh, Guido mentioned in his talk yesterday, um, we would also see a tendency for risk mitigation by deglobalizing. You know, the risk, uh, even the stuff, all the bad stuff happens in the, in the third world, so to say. So the safe thing is better to to withdraw from that, and this, of course, would lead to a tremendous welfare loss in, in poor countries. We'll have more bureaucracy, and there's also a risk if you manage to increase civil liability 
that we'll have more of a US style litigation regime. Um, we should remember when we do these things that it, it's, it's true that there was some success with GDPR in kind of exporting European standards and so on. It's, it's unlikely, I think, that we will be able to export these things you know, to our own uh, standards here, to uh, European standards, to the world. And, and the Europe as such is only about 15% of the global product. You know? So even, uh, even though we, we, you know, we, we, ask, we are actually declining, I mean, and the figures, by the way, do not look so good for that. I just take GDP and current prices and compare the US uh, China and, uh, and and Europe and so on and, and as you can see China just uh, superseded Europe in terms of absolute uh, gross domestic domestic product and it's also worrisome to see that the trend here is you know there's no trend you know in in your Euro in European uh, gross domestic product over the past you know many years now almost twenty years you know which is worrisome and is precisely we don't want this type of you know bureaucracy, risk aversion. So that's not what we need if we want to uh, succeed with um, green transformation or uh, uh, you know, European competitiveness. We, we want a dynamic and vibrant business environment in Europe. So I think this, if, if it works as, as, the, you know, as I read it, then, you know, um, then it, it could actually counteract you know, what, 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 uh, what, what we really want with, with the future of Europe. So, um, so my recommendations would be, would be that we remember the sustainable development goals go back. Uh, the idea here was that we partner with business. There is an interaction uh, with, uh, with the gov government and business institutions where we partner. And I think one of the main reasons why these sustainable development goals has come, have come as far as they have is because some of the large European and American companies actually have bought into them. You know, and are working, you know, to implement it and to uh, unfold them to, to in, in, in a global context. Uh, and uh, so if we stop this, you know, and now replace partnership with mandate, government mandate, I think you're going to see here some very different songs here being sung. We should also respect the better regulation principles, which means that from this directive, we should drop the director's duties as aspect, which have already been, you know, uh, you know, declared void and uh, unnecessary by, by the EU's, EU's own re regulatory scrutiny board. Um, and uh, we should remember maybe that boards are already fully responsible for law lawfulness. So if you want to kind of do more, uh, you, you run into some of these problems, uh, you know, which, which, uh, which I highlighted above. And um, with regard to supply chain due diligence, I really fail to see how directors can be responsible for anything but the, the, the direct business partners that companies have. If, if it goes all along the chain, it becomes very uh, you know, difficult to understand and to, you know, even to think about in, in, in present time. And if you also want long-term consequences and so on, I think it becomes impossible. And what happens is I think that directors will be, get scared you know they will they will and 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 this would lead to uh, you know some of the unfortunate uh, consequences that we talked about before so all together i think right now we had this distinct some people said that you know the nordic countries were very much against uh, you know the, the sustainable corporate governance you know and um, and the southern european countries thought it was a great idea you know and this this type of diversion or or disagreement in the ua i think right now it's not the time right I think we should try to work on things which, you know, for which we can build a broad social consensus and not try to, you know, enforce things which, which, which would lead to, you know, more dissension. For some people uh, in this part of the world, you know, this is serious business. They can't see why, you know, uh, why these things need to be implemented and, 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 and what good it does and so on. And they feel that it's a kind of invasion of the national corporate governance model. This is certainly the opinion of the Danish uh, Corporate Governance Com uh, Committee, the Best Practice Committee, which I'm meeting with uh, next Friday, actually, to talk about this. And they're, they're very worried about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Steen, for this uh, skating criticism of the directive. Now we go back to the details, uh, because uh, Florian will focus uh, on uh, uh, due diligence duties and uh, Article 26, which, which is an important component of this proposal. Uh, Florian, sorry, again, Florian Merslein is a chair of private law, German and European business law at the Philips uh, University of Marburg. 
and he's also an ACGI research member. Lonia. Thank you so much, dear Luca. Thanks for having me, and it's a great pleasure and, and great honor to be um, with you all tonight. Um, now, you are absolutely right, Luca, that uh, in a sense, what I'm going to present is, is more specific. It's going to build on what has already been said. Um, and then my focus will be on, on the relation between Article 25 and Article 26. So it's going to be a bit more uh, legal than, than what has been said before. Um, and at the same time, I will take into account um, the, the Article 5, which seems to be a, a cornerstone, um, the uh, due diligence um, um, policy requirement uh, that we find in, in, in Article 5, and that, which is then specified in, in Article 26. So I'm, I'm going to talk um, about director's due diligence duties, which in a way um, um, brings together um, Article 25 and 26 and which at the same time also brings a bit together uh, the discussions from yesterday and uh, today's discussions. Now, um, um, I, I should mention before that um, what I'm going to talk about is, is, is based on um, research that I'm doing jointly with Carsten and Sik Sørensen from University of Aarhus. So all credits go to him and all uh, mistakes are mine. Um, and we, the, the key, um, the key observation that, um, that drives us in a way um, is the question whether due diligence on the one hand and director's duties as, um, as uh, regulated in Article 25 are two different worlds or whether, whether um, these two um, regulatory contents of the directive um, interact with each other and if so, how they interact. Now, of course, due diligence is largely a, a contract law topic. It concerns the supply chains. It concerns the information and disclosure duties within these contractual relationships. So it clearly has a, a contract law um, aspect. It also has a public regulation aspect as uh, Guido Ferrarini has uh, mentioned yesterday. It is similar um, to bank regulation, but I think we should also um, argue, we should at least um, um, ask the question um, whether these due diligence um, duties have also a, a company law um, aspect. And as I have already mentioned before, um, my focus will be on, on, on Article 5 and on the, um, on the obligation to integrate due diligence into uh, the company's um, policies. Um, and um, I will take into account uh, the remainder of these due diligence um, um, provisions in Article um, 6 to Article 11. And on the other hand, um, um, uh, taking into account Article 26, um, with, um, which might be, um, as, as John has argued before, which might be a pure um, provision of, of, of competences of uh, like who, who is competent for um, these due diligence policies, but which might also have a, a duty aspect um, um, in, in its content. So basically, I will, I will ask three different questions. First, and mainly as a background, um, what is a due diligence policy as provided for in Article 5? Um, then second, how, how to establish it? Um, what, is, what are the forms? What are the procedures to establish such, uh, such policy? And the main point is the third point, um, which effects does it have in particular on, on director's duties? Now, what is a due diligence policy? Article five um, um, clearly says that member states shall ensure that companies integrate due diligence into all their corporate policies and have in place a due diligence policy. And it also enumerates the, the, the main elements of, of such policy, namely the description of the corporation's approach, um, including in the long, long term to due diligence. Secondly, the code of conduct describing rules and principles to be followed by uh, the company's employees and also by its subsidiaries. So it has a corporate group dimension here. And thirdly, the description of implementation processes including compliance. So not only like the substance of it, but also um, the question on how to, how to enforce it, how to comply with it 
um, within the company and probably also within um, the group of, of, of companies, um, if applicable. Now, if we think more about the substance of, of due diligence policies, um, uh, it is clearly about not only identifying uh, adverse impact, as has been mentioned yesterday, but also about preventing and ending uh, potential adverse impact. Um, and uh, Article 5 thereby clearly refers to um, Articles 6, 7, and 8, which are, of course, much more detailed um, and which have, in a way, to be, uh, to be read it um, 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 along with Article 5. So Article 5 is, is, is very general, um, but uh, the Articles 6, 7, and 8 um, um, are more specific, um, and they interact with Article 5. This is, um, is, is supported by, um, by a look into the recitals. Um, uh, recital 27 makes a clear distinction between prevention um, and bringing to an end. So the policies need to distinguish between these two aspects, um, but they're both part of, of uh, the due diligence policy. Um, more concrete um, 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 guidelines are given in, uh, in, in recital uh, 16 which refers to the OECD due diligence guidance, um, and, but also recital 26 um, that makes a reference to other international soft law frameworks. So all these different layers of, of, of rules and provisions um, have to be taken into account, which makes it of course um, very difficult and very um, burdensome to, to, to navigate and to map all these different um, provisions. Um, in addition, article 13, um, um, is a provision that allows for additional non-binding guidelines to be issued. So there will be another layer um, of, of provisions to be taken into account here. On a more fundamental level, um, one needs to think about what this due diligence policy requirement really means. And, and what is really specific about it is that a policy is by nature forward-looking, so it's an ex ante perspective, and that I think is something that that makes it completely different from traditional reporting or disclosure obligations, um, which are backwards-looking, which are um, ex post information duties. Um, it is a duty that is um, that is ex ante looking, that is similar to forecasts even to, to letters of intent and the like. So it's, it's um, declaring something about the future and uh, something about future um, behavior. And that is, that is um, um, an instrument that we are not very familiar with in, in, in corporate law. Now, which purposes does, the, does this instrument um, um, follow? It should, of course, clearly have a, a, an effect on, on, on directors themselves. Um, kind of nudging effect, so they they are required to um, to declare this policy, and then um, the expectation is that they follow um, it afterwards. Um, but at the same time, it also has um, um, or it also addresses shareholders and other stakeholders who are given a a, a kind of of, of measurement um, in order to to be in a position to ev evaluate um, directors' um, behavior. So it has this double, um, double um, um, function. Now, does a due diligence policy create oblig uh, obligation of result or obligation of means? That's something that has already been discussed yesterday. Um, and that leads me to the more general question about the binding effects of the due diligence policy. So can uh, can there be made a case that directors who do not follow their own policy um, are liable uh, towards the company? I will come back to this point um, at a later stage. Now, on a more formal level, um, the, the second point that I, I want to draw your attention to is how to establish a due diligence policy. Now, the, uh, the Article 26, um, Paragraph 1, um, um, tells us that the directors of companies um, are uh, competent uh, to, to um, develop this policy. And um, um, John has already rightly mentioned um, that uh, the directive 
counts or, or defines directors, um, not only including the management, but also including members uh, of administrative and supervisory bodies. So basically all kinds of directors, all sorts of directors, independent directors, but also the management. Um, the definition also refers to uh, chief executive officers and deputy chief dis, um, uh, executive officers, and even to other persons who perform similar functions. Now for a, for a um, provision on, on competences, um, that is a very broad understanding of directors because the question is really is who is then competent to develop this policy? Um, and and it, it seems very unusual that um, supervisory bodies um, are, have a primary uh, competence to, to um, develop a corporate policy here. Um, so the directive does not tell us really who among this large group of, of people is, is, is competent. Um, the question is whether um, member state provisions can be more specific on, on, on this, but the directive is not very clear on that. Um, the only hint that is given is in, in, in recital 64 um, that says that the responsibility can be assigned in line with the international due diligence frameworks, but that does not help too much. Now, um, um, what is um, important is that stakeholders need to be consulted. At least um, the directive says that there needs to be a due consideration for relevant input from stakeholders and civil society organizations. Um, the directive is not very clear on which stakeholders have to be taken into account. Does that include employees, for example? Um, but what is even more important is the question whether this is a duty to take um, these um, opinions into account or whether it is only an encouragement to consult these stakeholders. Um, Article 26 says that directors shall report to the board of directors in that respect. And that seems to me um, to establish a sort of comply or explain requirement. So, so if, if directors do not consult um, these interest groups, they need to report to the board why they don't um, um, consult them, but there's no clear obligation to consult them. Interestingly, um, there is a, an obligation to update um, the due diligence policy on an annual basis um, and also to, to have periodic assessments in order to monitor um, the effectiveness of, of, of these policies. Um, and in this respect, the directive is very specific. Um, it even prescribes that this monitoring um, um, exercise has to be based on qualitative and quantitative indicators. The directive is much less clear, on the other hand, um, with, re with, sorry, with regard to um, disclosure, um, more particularly with regard to the question whether the policy has to be disclosed, be it to shareholders or to other stakeholders. Article 11 is very vague in this respect. Um, it, it, it makes a link to reporting requirements um, under the non-financial reporting directive. Um, um, but if companies are not subject to this di other directive, um, then publication of an annual statement um, is required. Um, and now, uh, the annual statement is, of course, not the policy itself. It's rather a statement um, ex post, um, which, um, which declares whether or not a policy has been followed or not. So obviously, um, the policy itself does not need um, to be disclosed, but that is something that uh, should be discussed further. Now, the main, the main question is, um, what effect does a due diligence policy has, have? Um, it might be part, um, or it might be um, sanctioned within the framework of this internal complaint procedure as prescribed in Article 9.1. It might also fall under the supervision authority um, and the supervision procedure by national um, authorities that is referred to in Article 17. But the key question from a corporate law perspective is really whether um, and in what respect there are directors' duties linked to the uh, due diligence policy. And this is even more of a question because the policy is forward-looking. So um, the, the, the duty to establish a due diligence policy is quite clearly 
um, giving rise to, um, to director's liability in case of a lack or of uh, some kind of, of, of wrongful due diligence policy. So, so if, if uh, directors do not comply with the formal or substantive requirements um, with regard to the due diligence policy, that, that clearly seems to, um, to give rise to a, their liability. But the more difficult question is, um, does the due diligence policy create an obligation of result or an obligation of means? Um, and if it creates an obligation of means, it's still a question whether directors owe best efforts or at least reasonable efforts. And that is so fundamental because the due diligence policy would then um, have a binding effect on, on, on directors' future behavior. Um, it would be relevant within the business judgment rule and it would narrow um, the, the, the leeway of discretion that directors have. And in fact, the directive gives them some clear um, um, arguments that this is really um, the case, but it is not quite clear. But one argument seems to me that Article 26 is, is um, very close to Article 25. So uh, the rulemaker seems to think about um, 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 a link between the two, um, even if uh, the regulator does not say clearly how, how these two provisions interact. Um, and then Article 26, um, paragraph two, um, introduces a duty to embed the, uh, the, the due diligence policy into corporate strategy. And now corporate strategy is of course, um, something that is uh, like the, the core of, um, of, of business judgment. And therefore, I think the due diligence policy really narrows um, director's discretion. And that is, of course, um, a, a, a huge change. If that is the case, the question becomes even more relevant whether directors can deviate from their policy and under what circumstances they can do so. Um, do they have uh, some sort of duty to explain why they behave otherwise than they have previously declared? Um, and, and is there some sort of burden of, of, of proof if they deviate? Um, those are questions that really um, follow if, if, if uh, the business judgment rule is, is, is narrowed down by, um, by, as a consequence of Article um, 26. And all this relates, of course, to the provisions um, with regard to the liability of the company um, that are embedded in Article 22. Now, I end with more questions than answers, but probably that is, is quite natural at this stage. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Florian, for, for the great presentation. Lots of uh, details uh, and food for thought for, from each of the panelists, actually, and from John as well. So now we have uh, 40 minutes for Q&A, which is great. And um, I would uh, start, um, uh, unless any of the panelists uh, uh, has uh, anything urgent to, to say in, in, in response to any of the other uh, presentations, uh, I would read uh, or po pose some of the questions in the Q&A uh, to, to the panelists. Okay, I take silence as a, no urgency to, to speak from anyone. And uh, so there are a number of uh, interesting questions in the q and I will uh, start uh, with um, some questions about uh, Article 25. Um, there are uh, the, both, uh, uh, bo both uh, George Dallas uh, and Tom Gosling asked uh, about the similarities in the wording uh, between uh, this provision and uh, section 172 of the UK Companies Act, whether that is uh, the, the, whether the use of different words is, is meaningful or, or not. But uh, there is also a more substantive question by Alper and Götzlugol, um, which um, asks uh, where would the panelists think the bite of directors duty to consider sustainability lies, is not considered too weak. Any director can reasonably claim to have considered sustainability under any decision. How will, be the, inter how will the interplay be uh, with the business judgment rule? So is there anyone who would like to uh, chip in on this?
John, yes, please. Um, so, firstly, on the relationship between um, the uh, the proposed duty uh, to consider sustainability or to um, take into account the consequences of decisions for sustainability matters and the uh, example of the Section 172 duty in, in English company law um, seems to me very similar. Um, I don't think there's any material difference. Um, and that then, I think, leads into um, discussion of the broader question of whether consider is too weak. Um, and so on the face of it, this is a procedural obligation. Um, and so um, particularly if it's if it's seen as, as a um, as a duty um, of of good faith, that is to do what the director thinks is in the interest of the company, um, not what the court thinks, but what the director thinks, um, then it's pretty hard to show uh, that the um, consideration that the director thought was appropriate was not the right level of consideration. And therefore, it's pretty hard to see how this would actually uh, change much. Having said that, um, there are two sort of points where I think material change would be potentially delivered. The first is through reporting. Um, and in the UK, at least, the obligation for directors to report on how they've considered the interests of the various constituencies uh, actually has more impact than the obligation to consider itself because they have to state what they've done, they have to state how they thought about it and give some reasons for that. Um, that in and of itself, I think, is, uh, is, 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 is uh, meaningful. But the other point that I, I emphasised in my contribution is where we see an interaction with potential liabilities to the company um, for uh, failures in due diligence or, or inadequate due diligence uh, that gives rise to claims under the corporate liability provisions, uh, then I think the question would be not just you know, what level of consideration was given, but was the appropriate level of consideration given in the context of these potential uh, liabilities. Uh, and that's where I think the uh, Article 25's drafting is very interesting because the, uh, the title calls it duty of care, um, but then the actual text itself talks about the duty to act in the best interest of the company. And, and that, you know, wh whether this is a duty of care or a duty of good faith, I think is, is highly ambiguous from the text of the statement. But what I can see it as being is in practice where there is an underlying potential corporate liability, that's where a court might get involved in saying, well, you know, what level of oversight did you did you actually give to this? Was that was that a, an appropriate level of oversight given the size of the potential liability? Uh, and then in other contexts, uh, it, it, it would be more of a, a purely procedural matter. Thank you, John. I see Florian. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. I, I, I'm very grateful for, for Alperen's uh, question because it, 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 it really um, uh, leads to, to, to um, the core question. Um, if, if Article 25 is indeed very vague, then um, um, the due diligence policy could possibly provide the yardstick, which is, which is much, much more specific. Um, um, if, if directors have to declare beforehand how they want to behave with regard to sustainability issues and afterwards they beha behave differently, then they will have a problem to um, reasonably claim that they have uh, considered a sustainability. Um, um, at least they have to think before and if they behave differently afterwards, um, they, they have a justification um, issue here. Um, and therefore, and that's really, I think, is, is, is what makes Article um, 25 more intrusive um, um, I, is this instrument of, of, of not disclosure, but ex ante um, policy making obligation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Florian. Uh, next, uh, there are two questions again on article 25 that i uh, would like to to draw your attention on uh, together one is by daniela herrera who asks uh, can article 25 be interpreted as broadening the scope meaning of uh, corporate interest or, or uh, corporate purpose as, as they say in other jurisdictions and um, uh, jessica schmidt asked whether uh, 
one could view Article 25 as harmonizing the definition of company interest similarly and the scope of director's duties in Europe by the back door. Um, again, uh, would anyone want to answer these uh, questions? Is there an impact on uh, what's the goal of corporations is uh, from these, this new provision? Florian. A very brief answer. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that it is a clear yes. Um, of course, uh, defin defining director's duties um, relates to um, how we understand um, company interest, how we understand uh, corporate duties. Um, I would only disagree um, with Jessica um, because it's no longer by the back door. Um, um, this, this by the back door um, um, terminology has been used um, when, when um, these issues were tackled in the reporting directives. Um, and, and that was really through the back door because it wasn't really um, core company law. But now it's, it's much more moving to the center of, of European uh, corporate law. So, so um, I think the answer is yes, but no longer through the back door. But, um, quite the front door. Thank you. Okay, I beg to dissent on this because I, I would argue that uh, the liability, director's liability is such a, 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 a nuanced uh, matter uh, which uh, has so many interconnections with uh, other pieces of uh, one's legal system that it's really hard to think of these few lines uh, as uh, effectively bringing to uh, really harmonized regimes. The, the impact in practice can and will be very different depending on the jurisdictions, depending also on uh, courts uh, culture, uh, judges culture, uh, inter alia. So there are so, so many undefined uh, aspects of, of this duty that I, I strongly doubt that there will be much harmonization. Of course, it will act as a focal point. So every jurisdiction will have to review its director duties and may change the, the law one way, one way or the other, certainly more in the direction of uh, a stakeholderist view of the corporation. That's without doubt. Whether the outcome will be uh, uniform, that's another story. I, I see that Paul Davis may want to intervene on this. Well, just a very small point to agree with you, Luca. I think it's going to depend enormously on what the current state of national law is on what directors have to do in relation to the corporate uh, interest. Uh, I would have thought in the UK it's already the law that these matters have to be taken into account. And therefore, uh, the question is whether the, the article requires them to be taken into account in a more intrusive or rigorous way than they currently are and on that i don't know i guess the uh it, it's still an open question but not for the uk of course no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay I, I now have a few questions um, about uh, uh well one about renee's uh, study and two of them that are related to, to Rene's point. Um, um, David Manuel asks, uh, uh, how do you make sure the pool of directors is representative of all directors and not self-selecting as woke directors uh, uh, because they may be more interested in responding? And uh, Sel Shuk Argun, asks uh, Rene, I guess, uh, do you think defining directors KPIs in accordance with the directive may help them uh, make more uh, stakeholder friendly uh, decisions? And uh, finally, I think Tom Gosling had also a point about uh, remuneration. Uh, he, he writes, I think the remuneration provision might refer to situation where a company, sorry, no, this is, uh, well, so this is a point about the, uh, the disagreement, implicit disagreement between Georg and, and John. So Georg yesterday told us that uh, given the wording of Article 15, uh, uh, Paragraph 3, it would uh, practically never apply be, be, because uh, uh, companies would be uh, 
free to, to deviate from, from it. And, and, and John argued that basically everything is included. And, and Tom uh, had uh, some thoughts about this. Uh, I will only note uh, before giving the floor to, to John and possibly to Georg if he likes uh, um, that uh, the abstruse wording of Article 15, uh, Paragraph 3 is taken quite literally from the German Corporate Governance Code, which is a point that was made yesterday in the Q&A by Alex Schall. So the, in Germany already remuneration packages have to be consistent with these uh, pro provisos in Article 15, and that's the same in other jurisdictions such as uh, Italy. So, uh, John. Uh, John, uh, yeah, on just, this, and then we go back to, to Rene. I, I wasn't arguing that that was the, you know, the best interpretation of the wording. Um, it's uh, the, 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 the wording, literally, I think I agree. Um, it would be very easy for a company to avoid the supplying if, if um, the variable remuneration is um, not is, is purely focused on, for example, the stock price. Um, but it, but if that if that were the you know if that were the interpretation uh, that was taken forwards, then this provision doesn't do anything at all um, because a company that doesn't want it to apply just doesn't have any um, reference to uh, long term interests and sustainability in its variable remuneration. Uh, and so when I suggested a sensible interpretation. I suppose I mean a charitable or practical or teleological interpretation. Um, I'm not saying that that is the better literal interpretation. I agree it's not. It just seems to me that it's it's kind of devoid of meaning unless it's interpreted in that way. Thank you. Maybe a Georg would like to chip in. Just, just a brief point. I think we all agree that the wording of this section leaves room for improvement. Um, and I, you know, I was puzzled it by it myself so there are three ifs in this in this sentence and it, it seems easy to argue that at least one of these ifs is not fulfilled i mean if you take the text literally i agree that um, it would be nice if we found a better way of, of reading it and i hope that the text will be improved during the legislative process but as it stands it's very easy to find a way to say that the section should not apply that's uh, that was my point from me yesterday and agree that under german law that there's already a requirement to set remuneration in um in relation to uh, sustainability but um you know i think there are still ways of getting around the application that is why i suggested yesterday that in the current form um the section will not have great implication Thank you, uh, Georg. Uh, René, now the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks, David, for this um, good question. Um, so I guess conceptually, um, so the question is, um, how do we make sure our, our results are representative of all directors and um, we don't, we're not just picking up um, selection effects or response bias? Um, and so conceptually, the way we try to address this is, um, we try to we do everything we can to make sure that the directors don't know that we're trying to measure wokeness, right? So so we don't present the survey to the directors saying that we're interested in understanding um, whether you care about stakeholders, right? Um, so we present the survey to them as something different. Um, and actually, there's many questions in the survey, so I, it would be very difficult for the directors to understand ex exactly what the objective is. Um, so first, in the framing, we try to um, to make sure that the directors don't know that we're trying to measure, you know, how they consider the interests of stakeholders. Uh, but then you could say, well, there's still, you know, potential response bias, which is um, obviously always a concern. Um, and my answer there is, um, so we did the, the first survey in Sweden in 2006, um, which was a time period before people were talking about these issues, um, sort of in the, in the manner that they are now. Um, and um, the nice thing about doing it in Sweden is um, it turns out that Swedes like to answer surveys. Um, and so, uh, so we were able to survey the entire population of uh, directors of listed companies in Sweden, and our response rate was um, almost 40%. Um, so, you know, if there is response bias, I would argue that, um, you know, it's unlikely to, to drive our results in that study. Um, but then the other 
so we did that survey, but then we did it again internationally. Um, and we find very similar results. And so, you know, it's sort of like the more you do this, the more you find the same results. It, it's pretty hard to to argue that um, all the results are driven by response bias. Um, so, yeah, so good question. And hopefully we address the response bias issue um, sufficiently. Of course, more work needs to be done, right, which is part of my point that we really need more research uh, on these topics. Um, and then I guess, should I answer the second question, Luca, um, about, um, so the question was whether defining directors KPIs in accordance with the directive may help make them more stakeholder friendly decisions. Um, so, um, so basically, part of the point, or part of what we are, we're trying to argue in our research is that, um, you know, there is variation among directors. So some directors actually do decide um, more systematically in favor of stakeholders and some directors decide more systematically in favor of shareholders. Um, so now what what makes a director decide more in line with stakeholders um, in our analysis is um, personal characteristics. So, so their values. Right. And culture also plays a big role now. Um, so what we think our results show is that um, these are difficult decisions, right? So if we knew what the right answer was, we wouldn't have to have so much discussion, right? So, so it's not always obvious what the right decision is. And so what directors do in situations like that is, is refer to, you know, they, they need guideposts to help them make the decisions. And the guideposts in our context or in our, well, that we uncover are personal values and culture. Um, so I, I'm skeptical that um, that these rules would sort of systematically change how directors would decide is basically my answer. Thank, thank you, Renee. Now I have two questions for uh, Steen. Uh, one is by Frederic Barge. Uh, he asks, uh, with respect to incentives, what do you define then as long-term uh, uh, ownership. Uh, it's not clear what length of time is needed to have externalities included in market valuation. Going back to Easton and others, uh, 1991, convergence between market valuation and financial aggregated accounting already looked at a time horizon well beyond five years and closer to 10 years. Obtaining more insight in the proper understanding of long term is worth further research. And then Eva Micheler asks, um, uh, how, how can uh, focus on human rights in supply and change reduce uh, welfare in developing countries? Would you not expect labor standards to go up if buyers are encouraged to avoid supplies with poor standards? Steen. Okay, so first of all about the long term, um, I, I guess the, the longer the better. That's why I'm thinking about these long term shareholders often, you know, and those who just hold their stock until expiry. And I kind of like that model, but but uh, if you think about it as rewards for directors, um, uh, you know I think it's unreasonable to ask them to hold stock much more, uh, much longer than they serve in the company. So I think I would say as long as you serve in the company, you have some stock, and maybe you accumulate more, and then you uh, hold it until two years after you leave. I think that would be I've I've I've, I've tried to make that into best practice for some Danish companies. So that's a more kind of practical answer. Um, because of course, if you're not there, then what happens to the company, it, you know, is attributable sub to somebody else. Then uh, about uh, how could it hurt developing countries? Well, if you are, happen to be in a developing country which which has issues with human rights, you know, uh, and companies avoid them, uh, you know, because uh, you know uh, there's a supplier of a supplier of a supplier who has, uh, you know, an issue with something, and the, and the, this could be incriminating. Um, then they never get any development, right? They don't benefit from the foreign direct investment. So I think it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. And Mariana, please. Um, so, so I have a slightly different reading. I think a, a scene is, is, um, uh, is taking a strong view of elasticity here. So I, I, I rather sympathize with the, with the question. I think differences in um, salaries and also in terms of um, the materials necessary for production, uh, many of them are in, in developing countries. So uh, the, the relevant alternative would not be for companies to quit those countries entirely, but rather to care more about um, the standards 
existing uh, there. Um, uh, I, I think also something uh, to, to bear in mind is, um, is the Brussels effect and, and how EU exports its uh, regulation. Um, uh, talking about the GDPR uh, yesterday, and, and clearly this is a directive that is meant to have extraterritorial effects by design, but I think uh, even even beyond the scope of this directive, EU law is enormously uh, influential uh, around the world, and I think um, beyond it, country, uh, companies being covered by the directive, it could um, inspire uh, legislation around the world toward higher standards, and and I think really the differences are are so great that uh, the the alternative to decent standards in, in the global south is not relocating all of production to the EU, but rather having um, minimum standards, uh, a path toward minimum standards worldwide. Thank you, Mariana. And uh, Alessio raised his hand. Yes, a, a related point, uh, because I, I, note, I noted uh, uh, Steen's con concern uh, uh, with the um, with the unintended consequences of introducing liability, uh, both at the corporate level and the, and, and, and the director level. But I think these are two different issues, particularly, I mean, in connection with, with both what Mariana said today and, and both I, the way I tried to frame the corporate liability yesterday. I think we, we, we're talking about strategic use of, of limited liability by corporate groups. And in, in, a, in a world in which, I mean, this is not, probably what the directive is aiming to. I, I'm, we're not sure whether the level will get there, but in a world in which uh, companies can no longer use corporate vehicles strategically to evade liability. Uh, imagine a situation in which uh, strict liability carries over from any remote part of the, of the world to the parent company. Uh, and, and that has no repercussions on, on, on the, the box ticking attitude of directors to escape their own liability. Let's, let's take it aside. I don't see how this is a bad thing. Of, of course, the unintended concept you, you seem to be concerned about is whether uh, uh, this will also push directors to be defensive in their conduct, even in shaping corporate growth, uh, so as to avoid their own personal liability. But given the doubts have been here today on, on, on whether Article 25 will ever have any bite, uh, I'm not sure this, is, this, this, this should be a concern. Um, at all, actually, yeah. Thank you, Alessio. And I see Mariana's hand. Is that a new hand or a whole hand? Uh, it's a it's a new hand, Luca. Thank you. So I just also wanted to add something else, which is uh, first that, of course, uh, developing countries are very heterogeneous. You have very different uh, uh, countries with very different uh, legal systems. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, countries might be even in, in, the, in the frontier uh, concerning the adoption of those standards uh, in terms of having a stakeholder, stakeholder oriented duties. Uh, Brazil has long had them uh, in, in, uh, for directors, uh, also for controlling shareholders as well. I think this is something we did not discuss. The director does not go that way. Uh, maybe he could have, but he did not. Uh, uh, to be sure, I, I'm not claiming that they are enforced, and I think I, uh, I think the, the the experience we have in Brazil with respect to director duties is similar to what you have in the UK. You have different words on the books, but I, I don't think we have um, much evidence that it, it makes uh, that makes very much of a difference. But regarding other aspects, I think um, differences are actually more consequential. So something that is on is in my mind, and maybe that's where I'm coming from, uh, is that, uh, for instance, in Brazil there is uh, liability of parent companies for environmental harm. It is deemed to be here a consequence of the polluter pays principle. In the U, you have the polluter pays principle, but there's a lot of um, uh, but, but there's a different approach with respect to foreign subsidiaries. There's greater reluctance to automatically apply that uh, to foreign subsidiaries. So I think in many ways, there's a lot of uh, th uh, these stakeholder oriented uh, approaches are quite 
palatable in uh, to many developing countries where there are uh, very grave social problems, many of which will suffer tremendously the effects of, of climate change and where a lot of environmental disasters take place. Uh, so, so I would really resist that uh, the view that increasing standards in developing countries would um, would uh, necessarily hurt them quite the opposite, I think is the key. Thank you, Mariana. And I see Paul's hand up. I, I just wanted to raise a question about whether making parent companies liable for breaches of law by subsidiaries is a a better approach than the EU approach, which is laying down standards for the parents, because you'd need to look quite carefully, wouldn't you, at the, the system of law to which the subsidiary was subject, which would be the host country's system of law, presumably, and uh, see what that liability regime was. And you could see a system developing or a situation developing in which um, developing countries competed uh, for investments by offering liability regimes which were pretty lax. I mean, they might even pass a, spe a specific law exempting the subsidiary for the normal liability rules for a period of time. Um, so, whereas at least one advantage of the EU's approach is that the standards are laid down by the EU. They're not trying to piggyback on the standards of the host country, which might be pretty variable. Thank you, Paul. And I see Steen and then Mariana. And, and then well, on my list, uh, I have Tom uh, Gosling, uh, who hasn't raised his, his hand, but has uh, made a couple of good, very good questions in the Q&A that I would like him to, to ask uh, you. So oh, I, I just want to emphasize that I think directors take these things very seriously. And uh, the reason why they do is not necessarily because, you know, you pay a lot of, uh, you know, damages or, you know, th that a lot of fines taking place and so on, uh, a lot of liability in that. But if you have a case pending on, you know, some corruption case or, you know, some uh, money laundering case and so on, you're a director in a company uh, and, 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 and there's somebody investigating you. What happens is, uh, at least in my country, you are out as a director. You're simply, uh, an, you know, not a wanted person in the business community. The phone stops ringing, you get excluded and so on. So directors are really scared about this happening. And uh, if they can minimize the damage, you know, I th you know they of course prefer to, uh, to locate their activities in countries where this damage, where, where, where the likelihood of this happening is smaller, right? And so, uh, so the tendency would be, you know, to go for the top here. Why not? You know, it's not my money, right? Uh, uh, and, and I, you know, so. Thank you, Steen. I think Mariana would like to respond. To uh, I, I just wanted to to react um, to to Paul's uh, to Paul's comment regarding uh, 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 um, race uh, to the bottom in the regulatory slash uh, uh, liability front. I think. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, that lack standards uh, in developing countries, I think, are at the heart of uh, the problem that uh, we are discussing here, at least in terms of the human, in terms of the governance gap. Uh, it might be that there are problems on the laws on the books, and I think that's part of of the gap. And in some cases, it's not it's not that the laws on the books are problematic but rather uh, enforcement is problematic because of the, the um, challenges of judiciaries in uh, developing countries. Um, so uh, with respect to the latter point, and I think that's quite frequent that the problem is not that, that there is no tort law, most com countries have tort laws. <laughs> Usually the problem concerns uh, enforcement. And, and that is why I think us uh, taking seriously an enterprise approach, not only with respect to liability, but with respect to jurisdiction will be very helpful. There is a precedent of a French case concerning human, human rights issue in, in Congo. And it was even, the problem was not even, the issue was not even imposing liability on the parent, the, 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 the Congolese subsidiary was solvent. 
uh, it was rather having uh, um, uh, a qualified judiciary uh, hear the issue. So I think uh, the jurisdictional front is very important as well. In terms of the standards, I, I, I think the, the directive is trying to push in, in that direction precisely by tagging um, a, a lot of its framework on the international conventions. So, so I think uh, uh, part of that project, which which sounds very scary and broad <laughs> on some level is precisely finding a route through um, to uh, impose uh, those minimum standards where they don't um, yet exist. Thank you, uh, Mariana. Uh, we have still nine minutes. We, we may take a few more uh, if the, the discussion continues to be so lively. Uh, Tom uh, Godley, finally. Your, uh, yeah, thanks very much. And, you know, really congratulations to ECGI and all the panelists. It's been a brilliant um, event over the last couple of days. But one of the things that's come out is that it, whether whether you're sort of sympathetic to the aims of the directive or critical of it, I mean, there have been some pretty big problems identified with it. So either, um, you know, it's not going to achieve very much because of the lack of a focus on enterprise liability or misguided focus on directors' duties, or it is going to have very adverse impacts in terms of um, making directors run scared and loss of dynamism. Um, and I'm wondering whether anyone on the panel thinks that the directive as it is today does more good than harm, or is there actually a consensus that we need to take a step back from this and fundamentally reshape it, whichever side of the argument you're on? Thank you, Tom. And I'm tempted to ask each of today's panelists and, and John too, if they would like to uh, attempt uh, an answer to this fundamental question, given the reason why we are here. And I would, uh, if, if uh, you may not mind, I, I would like to start in reverse order. So Florian was last to speak. Would you like to go first? So here's my macro. Um, I can try to do so. Um, absolutely happy to do so. Um, it, it, <laughs> it is it is almost a, a philosophical question, I think, um, and it is it is really hard uh, to give to give a an answer that is 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 based on facts rather than on 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 feelings about about um, the the aim of the directive. Um, I. I, I, I think we cannot really um, we can we cannot really we are somehow embedded in, in 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 how we feel about the 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 urgence to to regulate on sustainability on on um, the urgence of regulated within corporate law um, and um, we are also embedded in our our little systems and traditions on 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 how to regulate these things. So um, probably we are all we are all uh, somehow um, embedded in, 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 and there's no objective answer to this. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. I guess I know Steen's answer to this question, but <laughs> if you'd like to add something, no, okay. Uh, Rene, do you have a view on this? <clears throat> um, um, yeah. So. Um, so I'm a big believer in informed policy making. Um, I think it's pretty clear that I wasn't very impressed with the, the research foundations of the proposal. Um, and so I think, and you know, I've tried reading this proposal. I think it's a good exercise for everyone to try and read this proposal for the non-academics, non-legal scholars. Um, I think it's a really good exercise so that you sort of see how complicated it is. Um, so. I would argue that um, a more concise identification of what the problem actually is and a simpler way or a simpler strategy of addressing it would be beneficial. So I would argue, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not about whether we need regulation, it's about whether this particular regulation in its current form um, is effective. I think one should go back to the drawing board. Thank you, Rene, and uh, now Mariana, if, if, you, if you want. 
Yeah, Luca, I'm not prepared uh, to, to answer this question. So I focused on uh, aspects of the directive that were my cl closer to my area of expertise. There's a lot in there, I think, uh, at least the one way I think uh, to, to take the question, I don't know if that's the way it was, it was like, overall, would the world be better off if the if this directive is enacted? And think then we have to trade off all advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I'm all, of course, in favor of um, uh, informed uh, research and, and, and that constrains what I can say about the directive overall. I think uh, clearly there is uh, room for, for improvement on, on several fronts. Um, I think there is also costs associated with not acting um, uh, with respect to various issues, including, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, climate change. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't uh, wait to see papers on every single point addressed by the directive before one, one could pass a directive on, on any particular issue. But, but I'm not prepared to say that overall this is for for the better, I think that would require a more dedicated study. Even though this, uh, the conversation uh, today and, and yesterday was was highly illuminating. Thank you, Mariana and, and John. Would you like to speak? So um, I think what's lurking in this question is, uh, you know, what, what's the opportunity cost? So um, you know, is the alternative to this nothing? Um, you know, would the moment be lost and, uh, you know, we, we might then get no meaningful measure or is the alternative, you know, a better prepared measure which can then be implemented more effectively. So if the alternative were the latter, then obviously uh, I think we would all go for that. And uh, there are many defects in the drafting of the proposal. And in some sense, it's, you know, it's like a piece of text that's had lots of edits, but hasn't been properly sort of put together in, in, in full coherence. But the you know, on, on balance, it seems to me that the, the measures, um, at least as respects director's duties, are, are pretty modest. Uh, and so uh, probably a, a modest step in the right direction, notwithstanding the defects, will be my, my, my reaction. Thank you, John. And um, I think we are close to, to the, the time scheduled for, for a, an end. We are um, two minutes. I, I would take the last two minutes to do my duty, which is also to draw some uh, conclusions from these two days. Not, not, not an easy task because uh, the breadth of uh, this uh, directive was uh, uh, quite uh, clear from the discussion yesterday and uh, today. I, I, if I can say a couple of uh, uh, things, uh, I, I would uh, argue that yesterday uh, we, we looked at the core of the directive, which is the due diligence in supply chain uh, provisions and, and also net zero plans. And uh, my impression from the discussion yesterday was that uh, the devil uh, is in the details when, when it comes to those uh, provisions. So there are a number of small choices that make uh, this uh, uh, directive uh, problematic. Uh, and, and here, the, the, the devil, uh, of course, in, is in the eye of the beholder. Th those who think that uh, th there should be an initiative in this direction will think that uh, the, these details are devilish in the sense that uh, the directive will have uh, too small an impact, whereas uh, those who think that um, the directive is doing uh, on its face uh, too much or could, to, could do harm will be relieved to see how many uh, uh, ways around uh, it there are uh, and how, how uh, uh, less strong the bite is of many of its uh, provisions. Today, I, I would say that uh, the, the, in the provisions that we have uh, focused on, the, the devil is in the vagueness of uh, these uh, rules. Uh, and, and again, uh, depending on, on what your view is, uh, you, you will find that good. Uh, or, uh, or bad. Uh, the other thing I, I would like to, to say is that this is a, a, a very um, uh, difficult uh, directive to deal with critically, and, and I'm quite impressed by Steen's uh, um, uh, uh, scathing criticism, as I call it, because it, it takes some, some guts to, to be so much against the, something that on its face is about uh, 
the good of the world. I mean, who can be a, a, against uh, uh, um, a, a something that uh, per, uh, whose goal is uh, to reduce the, 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 the amount of uh, human rights violation and environmental harm? We, we, we all like uh, these uh, goals. We, we all think that they are existential for, for, uh, for humanity. And so this is a, an area where the, the saying, uh, the better is the enemy of the good uh, applies very, uh, very well. And, uh, but at the same time, I think it's, it's our duty to um, make clear what uh, can be improved in, in the text. And I think a lot, a lot of idea came out from, of the discussion yesterday and today which is why I would like just to, to end by thanking uh, especially, uh, first of all, Eric Liedman and Rolf Skog and their center for organizing the event, Ellen McPartland for um, being behind it uh, as always with the, the communications and the logistics and the technology and ECGI more generally, and uh, all uh, the uh, speakers and the panelists uh, and the attendees who asked uh, great questions or made uh, um, important comments both yesterday and today. Uh, I can only apologize if we didn't have time uh, to read uh, them all, to respond to them all. So uh, thank you again for your attention. And uh, I think this is just the be beginning of a, a long uh, uh, policy debate uh, where academics uh, will have uh, their voice uh, heard, hopefully, and the stakes, uh, I, I think it was clear enough, are uh, high. Thank you very much.